Dr. Vishwanath Karat, MIT World Peace University, organized by MIT School of Government, Bharatiya Chhatra Sansad, and supported by UNESCO Chair. I welcome each one of you for this very, very important four-day international conference on eradication of biological and chemical weapons. We all have joined this conference today to understand and to discuss what exactly is the role that universities can play to handle this very, very horrifying issue of misuse of weapons of mass destruction. Yesterday in a session we saw when one of the esteemed speaker, Mr. Weber, showed us that he, he, he has witnessed a entire facility which can produce tons and tons of anthrax. So we, we, everyone in the audience as well as in the speaker panel were speechless and, and they all were horrified to see that something of this sort can also happen in the world. So let us join hands together and understand how us universities can play, play their role and contribute to curb this misuse. And we have today with us to discuss on this very, very important issue, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Mahatma Gandhi University, Kerala, Professor Dr. Sabu Thomas. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much for joining us. We also have Honorable Vice Chancellor of Dr. Ram Manohar Lohia Avad University, Faizabad, Uttar Pradesh, Professor Dr. Manoj Dikshitji. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. We also have with us the Honorable Vice Chancellor of SRM Institute of Science and Technology and former President of Association of Indian Universities, AIU, Professor Dr. Sandeep Sanchetiji. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. We also have with us the former Vice Chancellor of Maharashtra University of Health Science, Nashik, Professor Dr. Arun Jamkarji. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. And now, before we begin with this session, I would like to request the moderator of this session, the Registrar of MIT World Peace University, Dr. Prashant Daveji, to kindly give the introductory remarks. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Gautam Bapat, sir. Uh, a warm welcome to all the eminent speakers, panelists, and distinguished audience. Uh, I'm really uh, delighted and uh, looking forward to this particular session uh, chaired by our revered uh, founder, president, uh, Professor Dr. Vishwanath Karat, sir, Rahul, sir, and uh, looking forward to hear from all the eminent speakers for this session who are, in true sense, the real educationists, the academicians who are laying the foundation of a strong future uh, through their various universities. Uh, the session uh, goes with how exactly the university can contribute to curb the misuse of weapons of mass destruction. The seed thought for this discussion has been planted already by our uh, revered founder, uh, Dr. Vishwanath Karad, sir. And uh, we are discussing all sorts of scenarios and how exactly today the session, which is basically about the contribution and the role of university, I definitely believe and I, I definitely I look forward to hear a resounding thought by all our audience, all our participants that universities have an exceptional capability to nurture and develop the young minds in an extraordinary way, which will have far reaching impact in for the for the generations to come and none other than the universities a progressive university who shall train and produce some of the finest scientists and technologists in years to come hence it is imperative for all the universities to understand the responsibility of nurturing these young minds especially the young minds working in the field of biological chemical biodiversities and all these aspects contributes. One more important point here I want to highlight is the university can create uh, a public awareness movement to stop uh, people from engaging any kind of such kind of uh, technological advancement. So it's important that the young generation uh, is trained and nurtured in a right way. And I believe universities has a very big role in uh, nurturing these young minds to ensure that our future generation is in safe hands. And um, uh, universities can make efforts to create awareness among students about how the hazards have menaced communities for decades 
and in some cases centuries uh, we all are most, we are we are all aware of the kind of situation that we have faced uh, due to these kind of biological weapons or any kind of nuclear weapons that have been used in past so it's also to understand students that these hazards presents a unique challenge due to the fact that much less is known about them and they are created with intent so it's very important to streamline these intents nurture right intent and inculcate the right kind of value system for our students and universities has a biggest role to do so i am really delighted and look forward to hear from all the eminent speakers uh the context is rightly set by our founder president founder executive president and uh, over to you gautam sir uh, we can move ahead with the first speaker and thank you continue with this session thank you thank you thank you very much sir for your uh, kind introductory remarks and now it is indeed my honor and privilege uh, uh, to move ahead in this very very important session but yes as uh, we have been discussing that what exactly is the role that universities can play and how exactly we as teachers can play our role to curb this misuse of weapons of mass destruction so as we discuss this i would like to request my technical team if they could please kindly relay a small film made on this very very important topic over to my it team If we look at a century behind us we have striking cases that demonstrate leadership and decision making crisis like the case of Hiroshima Nagasaki and Bhopal gas tragedy Education plays a vital role in shaping the building blocks of society the youth who are the future Let us discuss how universities can contribute to curb misuse of weapons of mass destruction at international conference on eradication of biological and chemical weapons thank you thank you very much uh, for that film and definitely that underlines the need of how exactly uh, why exactly it is needed that we all must discuss this topic well my friends uh, now we have reached a moment uh, in the session that where we uh, join our digital hands i would say uh, for the uh, picture perfect moment so i request everyone to adjust their cameras and get ready for a group photograph uh, where all the windows would be captured together uh, there won't be any photographer at such because of uh, this technological hurdle so you won't see people <laughs> running around with the cameras but uh, our it team would uh, grab the screen and uh, take uh, the photograph so i request everyone to please switch on their cameras so that uh, we can uh, capture this moment let's put on some smile on our faces and uh, get ready for uh, the picture perfect moment it Thanks, team done thank you very much uh, this <laughs> this always feels a little funny but uh, yes we'll have to accept this new normal uh, the way uh, we have been used to <laughs> thank you very much uh, for that thank you very much for joining digital hands for uh, this beautiful photograph and now uh, it is my indeed honor and privilege uh, to invite the first uh, eminent speaker of uh, the session the honorable vice chancellor of mahatma gandhi university kerala professor dr sabu thomas ji but uh, before i invite him i would like to introduce all of you professor dr sapu thomas well my friends uh, i always feel uh, uh, that i am in a cash 22 situation whenever i am uh, introducing academic stalwarts and today i don't have uh, one not two not three but four academic stalwarts uh, who are who have joined in this session and when i when i i have to introduce them i just don't really understand from where to start and where to end because their academic profiles are so big and they have done so much of work so i just really don't understand so i would like to apologize to all the honorable vice chancellors i would be picking up randomly from your uh, uh, information by data and i would be put sharing something uh, uh, with the audience uh, professor dr sabu thomishi on currently honorable vice chancellor of mahatma gandhi university uh, he has phd in engineering from indian institute of technology karakpur 
in the field of polymer blends thermoplastics. He has a BTEC in engineering from University of Cochin in polymer sciences and robot technology, and he has his BSc from University of Kerala in chemistry. Uh, he has uh, held numerous uh, positions and even he was associated with industry also. Uh, from 1987, uh, in, in, in the year 1987, he was the technological officer at the Bayer India. He was also associated with rubber production as a rubber production officer with Bata. Uh, his academic and teaching administrative experience in India goes to many, many academic institutions like Indian Institute of Technology, Karakur, Mahatma Gandhi University, Kottayam, Kerala, then Mahatma Gandhi, uh, I'm sorry, a regional director of the School of Technology and Applied Sciences. He was the full professor at School of Chemical Sciences, Mahatma Gandhi University, and many, many more. But his major field uh, of interest has been uh, the polymers, fiber filled polymer composites, and a particular particulate field polymer composites, and so on. Uh, he has a vast experience of uh, visiting and doctoral uh, professorship abroad as well. He has worked in Quebec uh, level University, Canada. He has also worked in Belgium. He has worked in many, many other international universities as well. Sir, it is indeed our honor and privilege to have you here with us today. Thank you very much for joining in. And without wasting a single more minute, I hand over the control to you. Over to you, sir. So thank you so much for your kind words of introduction. I am extremely delighted that uh, MIT World Peace University is organizing a four-day international conference on eradication of biological and chemical weapons. Congratulations. This is probably my second interaction with your university. Uh, sometime back, I was in your campus and uh, participated in a discussion meeting. I'm really happy that you have chosen a session on how universities can contribute to curb issues of weapons of mass destruction. So congratulations again for the nice topic. I am from Mahatma Gandhi University, Kottayam. Uh, sir, I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, but I think that some of the software controls of Cisco WebEx software are uh, middle, on the middle of your slides. If you could please move them aside, we'll be able to see the full slide. Right now, they're actually overlapping the slide content. I see. Right. Yeah, yeah. Some, some, those, some of the controls of yeah. Please just move them aside so that we'll be able to see this. Is it okay now? Oh, yeah, we are not able to do that well. Okay, okay, never mind, never mind. Please go ahead, sir. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Uh, let me show you my slide. My first slide is uh, the topic is on weapons of mass destruction. So, weapons of mass destruction, what's the definition of that? It can kill lots of people, human beings, and cause damage to man made structures. That's the basic meaning of mass destruction. You can see a uh, bombing of a city. Uh, the key features of mass destruction include potential of large scale destruction, indiscriminate nature of their effects. Yeah. If I show you my next slide, when you look at the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, you have biological weapons, chemical weapons, nuclear weapons, radiological weapons. And I, I, I also see, I've shown some of the nice pictures of different types of weapons and their mass destruction. If you look at the biological weapons, you know what people do, they make use of bacteria, virus, different microorganisms, fungi. And when you look at biological weapons, they are very complex systems that can disseminate diseases, causing organisms or toxins to harm the human beings. And if you look at the biological weapons, they have two important parts, 
One is the weaponized agent, the other one is the delivery mechanism. If you look at the history, you will find that Japan deliberately infected Chinese vaccination via biological weapons. 1930 to 1945, the Second World War. And how many people died? 10,000 people, 10,000 fatalities. And Japan also actually killed their own people uh, by mistake using biological weapons. If you look at chemical weapons of mass destruction, they use uh, different types of chemicals, very toxic materials. It could be sulfur it could be sarin gas, it could be uh, Agent Orange. You know, people use Agent Orange in Vietnam, especially by the Americans. White phosphorus, chemical weapons used by the Nazis. We have lots and lots of examples of chemical weapons of mass destruction. And these chemical weapons were used in World War One, World War II. If you look at nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons are quite, uh, quite dangerous. And again, if you look at the chemistry of nuclear weapons, it could be fusion reaction or fusion reaction thermonuclear systems. And in the introduction, you have talked about Hiroshima. So many people were killed in Hiroshima. I happened to visit Hiroshima several times. I'd been to Hiroshima University because we had a research collaboration with them. And if you look at the current nuclear situation, 21,000 between 21,000 and 30,000 nuclear warheads are available in the world war. And again, if you look at the literature, you can see that around 5,000 nuclear heads are ready to be used within 30 minutes. You can see how powerful they are. Again, if you look at the nuclear weapons, uh, I said that around 30,000 nuclear weapons are available now. Look at this capacity. 200 thousand times a Hiroshima bomb. You see, look at the capability of the nuclear weapons. If you look at the radiological weapons, you know what they do, combine radioactive material with conventional explosive to spread it. And you can use short, you can use different types of radiological weapons. It has, it has short and long-term health problems most vulnerable, yet accessible, wide applications for radioactive sources, including agricultural medicine, lots of applications if you look at the other side. Let me show you the implication, what were the implications of World War I? Look at Russia. 70 lakhs people died in Russia because of World War I. Almost the same number of people died in Germany, 70 lakhs. France, 18 lakhs, Austria, 12 lakhs. Look at the casualties of World War I. If you look at the number of wounded people, 49 lakhs people wounded in Russia, 42 lakhs people wounded in Germany, 42 lakhs wounded in, um, in France. So lots of people were dead, lots of people were wounded. And I've taken some photographs of, um, uh, from Russian uh, you know, uh, uh, history book about World War I. Look at World War II, and I have a slide which shows the percent of people died. Poland was the choker, followed by Soviet Union, Yugoslavia, Germany. Uh, the percent of people died based on their population. So, so much of casualty. Now, because after World War Two, UN was created, the United Nations was created. What was the purpose of the United Nations? The United Nations was created for preserving peace through international cooperation and collective security. And I also want to tell you that if you look at the UN's budget, UN's budget is actually less than 1.8% of the world's military expenditure. So, the funding of UN is not that great. 
Let me now show you the military expenditure worldwide, how much money is spent for military. You will see United States is a choker, spending a lot of money, followed by China, and then you can see Saudi Arabia, India, France, Russia, a lot of countries spend a lot of money, but the choker is United States and China. China's expenditure is almost uh, five times or four times, more than four times than that of uh, India. And again, I have a geographical picture. Look at North America. North America actually spent the largest amount of money on military. 45% of the total budget of the weapon actually is from the United I mean, from North America. The exact figure is more than. Seven or seven billion dollar funding for a military. This is followed by Europe, twenty-four percent, three seventy-six point three billion. Then you can see lots of money is being spent in Asia, eighteen percent, two eighty-seven point six, majority from China. And then I have a slide which shows. The biggest five sellers of arms in the world, United States, the Trooper, followed by China, United Kingdom, France, and Russia. And I made a statement, if we can avoid wars, the excess military funding can be used for nation building by alleviating poverty and improving riches. I also have a slide from Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. Spending for peace versus spending for war. There's a large gap between what countries are prepared to allocate for military means to provide security and maintain their global and regional power status. On the one hand, and to alleviate poverty and promote economic development. There's a big gap because all countries spend a lot of money for military. I again have a slide on war versus poverty. If you look at the global picture, 1,600 million US dollars are spent, are spent in 2011 for arms. Now I wanted to add that, you know, providing basic health care to those country without the benefit is 20 billion per annum. Providing shelter to those without is 21 million per annum. If you add up everything, the humanity could be served with food, water, and health facilities with $129 million. And you see how much money we spent. $1,600 billion are spent. The dollars were spent in 2011. And how much money we need to look after the humanity health, water, everything, shelter, one to nine, we need only that much. You see how much money we spend for, uh, uh, for uh, military. Then let me show you some of the points to be, to, to think about it, to ponder. Imagine if all the military mind and power and money that is being spent on war was spent instead on funding other nonviolent solutions the world would have been a different place. And now I'm going to show you, with this background, I'm going to show you what universities can do. My first slide is universities all over the world to provide value-based education. Proactive research approach on peace, value-based education, optimized utilization resources, Exploiting expertise of faculties, researchers, scientists, technicians, students, for balanced holistic growth. Creating awareness about the consequences of war. That's what universities can do. Again, I would say we have to adopt the Gandhian philosophy, Gandhian mode of education, the so-called value-based education, ethical guidance in research work, providing access and quality education. Targeted location specific CV programming, geopolitical alliance, building cultural respect, reconciliation, solidarity, addressing human needs, dismantling cultural war, 
global partnership of the UK. These are the elements of value-based education according to Mahatma Gandhi. I wanted to quote the great philosopher from uh, uh, from uh, from a European country from from uh, Dutch Netherlands. Spinoz. Spinoz said, "This is not the absence of law." According to Spinoz, this is a virtue, it's an attitude, tendency to good, trust, and justice. Again, I wanted to add that this education is considered to be the considered to be both philosophy and the process involving skills, including reasoning, problem solving, cooperation, and conflict resolution. Again, Spinoz says. This education is nothing but empowering people with the skill, attitude, and knowledge to create a safe world and build a sustainable ecosystem. And so I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, we have to keep some time in the reserve for the questions and answers also. Governance of life. I'm going to stop now. And I also want to tell you that the perception of peace, the peace education involves several components well functionalized government, good relationship with neighbors. Low level of corruption, acceptance of the rights of the people. So it, it has lots of components of peace education. And I would say universities should inculcate the instincts of peace in students. Peace education should be part of the curriculum. Educate students with consequence of war. Motivate and encourage students to be better human beings. And I will also say that. We have to create awareness about the consequences of war, social awareness about the consequences, political awareness about the and diplomacy tactics, positive protest, and influence in the youth. And if you look at the peace education, peace education has different components, dismantling the culture of war, cultivating inner peace, living in harmony with the earth, building cultural respect, living with justice and compassion. And finally, I want to say that this is my last slide. Peace education is not an easy task to accomplish. We have to really make excellent content for the peace education, and we also have to teach peace education at the universities. And if you look at again peace education, the academic content is very important, practical skill is very important. The pedagogical content is very important. Therefore, I am sure that universities can do a great role in controlling arms and to create a peaceful ecosystem in the world. Because by doing peace education, by introducing peace education as part of the curriculum, thank you so much for your patient hearing. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your kind inputs. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. My friends, uh, 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 as you all are aware that we have kept some time in reserve for the questions and answers. So I request each one of you to please post your questions in only questions and answers box. I can see that you're posting some of your questions in the chat box. Please note that the questions posted in chat box will not be answered. So I request you to post your questions in the question and answer box only. I'm your host, Gautam Bapat. You can find my name in the Q&A box and please post your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to move to the next point on agenda. In this very, very important session where we have the vice chancellors of many universities with us, we also have a, a student representation who's representing the youth of our nation. A student of MIT World Peace University, Sri Rajat Jasuja is also with us. Uh, I would now request him to kindly share his thoughts with everyone in the audience. Over to you, Jasuja. Thank you, sir. MIT World Peace University के इस आज international conference में आयोजित आप सब को मैं स्वागत करता हूँ। हम लोग ये चर्चा करने जा रहे हैं कि रासायनिक हथियार पूरी दुनिया के लिए कैसे खतरा है और उसके जो reaction है उसके उसको पूरी दुनिया भर के विश्वविद्यालय कैसे रोक सकते हैं। तो मैं ये सोचता हूँ कि जब पूरी दुनिया भर के जो छात्र हैं उन्होंने आज भारत ने एक बड़ा प्रमाण जारी किया है भारत ही नहीं पूरी दुनिया भर में एक बड़ा प्रमाण हम लोगों ने जारी किया है छात्रों ने जारी किया है वो क्या है कि हम कहीं भी कोई ऐसी जो यूनिवर्सिटी से लड़ाई शुरू होती है वो एक सकारात्मक परिणाम तक पहुंची है चाहे आप यूनिवर्सिटी चाहे वो आप साउथ अफ्रीका के रंगभेद को देख लो 
हम लोगों ने नेल्सन मंडेला को वहां पे राष्ट्रपति बना के एक छात्रों की लड़ाई वहां पे जीती दूसरी तरफ आप आसाम में एक 33 साल के युवा यूनिवर्सिटी से डायरेक्ट निकल के वहां पे मुख्यमंत्री बन जाते हैं जिनको हम प्रफुल्ल कुमार मोहंतो के नाम से जानते हैं तो ये इस बात को सिद्ध करती है कि छात्रों की लड़ाइयों ने हमेशा एक सकारात्मक परिणाम देखा है अगर हम केमिकल वेपन फ्री वर्ल्ड की बात करते हैं तो मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि इसकी शुरुआत सिर्फ और सिर्फ भारत इसलिए कर सकता है क्योंकि भारत की जो औसत आयु है वो टोटल उन्तीस वर्ष है और अगर हम एक पुरानी रिपोर्ट और देखें जो टाइम्स ऑफ वर्क टाइम्स ऑफ इंडिया में एक जो 2014 में छपी थी उसमें यह छपा था कि 31 करोड़ से अधिक लोग आज छात्र भारत में हैं जो कि पूरी दुनिया भर में सबसे ज्यादा है और दूसरी बात जो एक और महत्वपूर्ण बात उन्होंने कहा कि ढाई करोड़ से अधिक लोग आज यूनिवर्सिटीज में बच्चे पढ़ते हैं तो मैं ये समझता हूं कि जो हम बोएंगे वही हम काटेंगे अगर यूनिवर्सिटीज ने ये ठान लिया कि हमने ये हम लोग अगर ये एक फोर्स तैयार कर सकें तो हम केमिकल वेपन फ्री वर्ल्ड से ज्यादा दूर नहीं है लेकिन आप दूसरी तरफ देखें कि भारत में जो आज एक समस्या है कि हम जो हेल्थ है जो राइट टू हेल्थ हम मैं छत्तीसगढ़ का छात्र हूँ छत्तीसगढ़ में राइट टू हेल्थ लागू होने जा रहा है हम लोग भारत के लोग एक दशमलव का हेल्थ में इन्वेस्ट करते हैं दूसरी तरफ आप डिफेंस में देखोगे तो उसका दोगुना मतलब ढाई परसेंट आप जीडीपी पे इन्वेस्ट करते हो जब मैं इसके बारे में सोच रहा था तो मुझे गांधी जी का एक मशहूर वाक्य याद आ गया कि खुद में वो बदलाव लाइए जो आप दुनिया में देखना चाहते हैं अगर हम रासायनिक फ्री वर्ल्ड का सपना देख रहे हैं तो पहले हमें इसके बारे में ये सोचना पड़ेगा कि इससे पहले कौन कौन से राष्ट्र ने इसको डेवलप किया और उसके बाद डिसमेंटल किया तो पूरी दुनिया में मात्र एक राष्ट्र है जिसका नाम साउथ अफ्रीका है जिस, जिसको उन्होंने 1980 में डेवलप किया और उन्नीस में उन्होंने ये लोगों को बता दिया कि हम लोग डिसमेंटल कर चुके हैं लेकिन अब 1900 जो साउथ अफ्रीका की जो डेमोग्राफिक है और भारत की जो डेमोग्राफिक है उन दोनों में बहुत फर्क है साउथ अफ्रीका की नेबर कंट्रीज है जिम्बावे बोट्सवाना और नेम्बिया लेकिन हमारे जो साइड के जो कंट्रीज है नेबर कंट्रीज है वो है पाकिस्तान वो है चाइना वो है श्रीलंका और अभी बांग्लादेश आपकी बांग्लादेश आपकी नीतियों से खुश नहीं है चाइना हमारे बॉर्डर पे आता जा रहा है पाकिस्तान पहले ही आतंकियों को शरणार्थी देते रहा है तो हमें ये सोचने का समय है कि भारत इसके प्रति कैसे जागरूक हो सकता है हम लोग एक तरफ देखते हैं कि अगर हम युद्ध में जाएंगे तो हम फूड सिक्योर्ड राष्ट्र तो है हम अपने आप को फूड सिक्योर्ड बताते तो है लेकिन हम उन तक पहुंच नहीं पाते उन लोगों को तक खाना नहीं पहुंचा पाते तो हम लोग इंडस्ट्रियल जो डेवलपमेंट है उसमें भी पीछे हैं। दूसरी तरफ आप साउथ अफ्रीका को देखोगे तो वर्ल्ड बैंक की एक रिपोर्ट आई जिसमें उन्होंने कहा कि इकोनॉमिक स्टेबिलिटी के नाम पे साउथ अफ्रीका पहले नंबर पे है और भारत डेढ़ सौ देशों की लिस्ट में पंचानवे नंबर पे है मैं ये सिर्फ इतना ही इतना कहना चाहता हूं अगर हम पीस चाहते हैं अगर हम शांति चाहते हैं तो हर व्यक्ति को अपनी रोटी कपड़ा मकान रोजगार और उससे भी अधिक जो बात है कि जो हमारे देश ने हमको दी है वो संस्कृति अगर हम उसको बचा सकते हैं तो वो मात्र एक ही कारण है वो है यूनिवर्सिटीज की पढ़ाई वो है रोजगार और हमें इस बारे को सोचना पड़ेगा और मुझे गांधी की फिर से मुझे अंतिम अपने भाषण में सिर्फ इतनी याद आती है कि जो गांधी ने कहा था वो पूरी दुनिया को बताना और पूरे मशहूर करने की बात यह है कि अगर हम आंख के बदले आंख की लड़ाई लड़ेंगे तो पूरी दुनिया अंधी हो जाएगी मैं सिर्फ इसी माध्यम से कहना चाहता हूं कि अगर हम पीस की तरफ जाते हैं तो हमें गांधी को याद करना पड़ेगा हमें देश की यूनिवर्सिटीज को जानना पड़ेगा देश की यूनिवर्सिटीज की वो पावर को जानना पड़ेगा कि वो पूरी दुनिया भर में ऐसी फोर्स तैयार कर सकती है कि हम किसी भी मुद्दे को अपना सकते हैं थैंक यू जय हिंद थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच रजत थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर योर व्यूज थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर रिप्रेजेंटिंग यूथ यंग सिटीजन ऑफ ऑफ आर नेशन and making their thoughts uh, reach us thank you very much for that and it is indeed my honor and privilege to introduce you to the next eminent speaker of this session professor dr manoj dikshit ji honorable vice chancellor of dr ram manohar lohia avad university sir has completed his phd from university of lucknow in year 1994 he has masters of public administration and chancellor's gold medal for the graduation top of the class d lit of university of lucknow uh as a as vice chancellor i mean uh, before that he has been taken many many positions uh, of prestige in academics professor and head of department of public administration the department of public administration is one of the oldest departments of public administration in entire india established in year 1963 he was the director of institute of tourism studies university of lucknow 2013 to 2017 uh the charges of the addition of the position of professor and head of the department of public administration University of Lucknow 
He was governor's nominee as member of Executive Council of Satna, Madhya Pradesh. Mahatma Gandhi, Chitrakoot uh, Vishwavidyale, researcher, School of Political Sciences and Public Administration. And he was a director of Dr. Girilal Gupta Institute of Public Health and Public Affairs, University of Lucknow from 2007 to 2011. And probably many, many more positions uh, he has held in his life, which I can talk about. But you know, uh, I would like to listen to him more uh, and, and I, I would not invest more time in reading his positions. I'm really sure that we all are keen to listen to him. And without wasting any further minute, I would like to request him to kindly address the gathering. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gautam. Uh, it's a real and indeed an opportunity to be uh, speaking today, finally, on MIT platform. I had, was given uh, an opportunity to speak to Chhatra Sansad, uh, I think the last year or the before last year, which I could not attend due to my health reasons. Uh, fortunately, I visited MIT campus twice, so I'm quite well aware of the role that you play in this. Uh, and uh, organizing this beautiful conference, a four-day conference, is something in the series of good things that you do, are very rare things that you do. Uh, while reading my file, you missed one small point because that was totally influenced and uh, by and uh, in fact helped by the MIT's uh, team of uh, under the Mr. Rahul Kalat. We also started a school of democracy in uh, Lucknow University and I was heading that school of democracy, which was totally uh, influenced by your own school of uh, democracy, uh, which I did uh, head for about two, three years and uh, started a course of leadership as well. Uh, Today's topic is very important, though I'm not a scientist to, um, unfortunately, I'm not a scientist to understand nitty gritties of uh, uh, the weapons of mass destruction. But uh, what well, we can understand that uh, whichever form of uh, weapon of mass destruction that we talk about, whether it's a nuclear or radiological or chemical or biological or any other weapon, uh, they can kill and bring significant harm to numerous humans and all those humans who, who face the consequences of such a war are not the people fighting the war. They are the casualties who are non-participant, I can say, in the war, and yet the maximum casualties. Uh, take the war from any time, uh, maybe as, as old as uh, 6200 BC, when the famous Ayodhya war took place to the latest war that we have, we can talk about the Kargil and all. We have all had uh, uh, the casualties of different kind and the war that was fought was not fought on ethics and rules. So uh, when we talk about these weapons of uh, mass destruction, we are actually, this, this term was initially coined to, in reference to aerial bombing or the chemical explosive or the World War II uh, but then uh, very soon you can uh, you can find that the rules of the game were violated and each war ended with a catastrophe of different sort. Uh, if you visit uh, uh, Hiroshima or Nagasaki and the museums that, that they are there with the remains of uh, the Holocaust that caused millions of deaths in, uh, in a matter, matter of minutes, we realize that the war, and I firmly believe a war is never won. A war is always lost. The cost has to be given by both the so-called winner and the so-called loser. And therefore, we have to understand that the, the, the reasons for fighting a war have to be understood better by, by the younger generation now. Of course, the older generation can be no exception that they cannot understand and they should not understand. We also understand the fact that the uranium bomb that uh, detonated in Hiroshima was uh, a hundred, uh, about uh, 15,000 tons of TNT, and today's bombs that we can talk about are 300 times more lethal than what they, they, they are now. Uh, what they were, they, it was there in Nagasaki, in Hiroshima. And uh, second point that I want to highlight here is that the, the consequences of these weapons of mass destruction, whether it is a nuclear or it is a chemical or a biological, are do not end with the end of the game or end of the war. They begin from there. 70 years down the drain, Hiroshima and Nagasaki still suffers from the trauma of the, the nuclear bombs. Each one of these uh, weapons, if used, 
lead to consequences beyond imagination and beyond control. Uh, my previous speaker did mention Bhopal gas tragedy, though it was not a war, but it was a huge chemical tragedy that took place and caused so many lives. Uh, government except only 3,800. But even if it took place in, uh, say, say, about 30 years back, the consequences of that tragedy are still felt. The impact on the bodies and minds of the people are still felt. And you still do not have many answers to those questions that are raised by these survivors. Therefore, uh, one thing we must understand that the power of the bomb is not the power of the war. The power of the bomb are not going to solve the problems of the world. And therefore, we can talk about uh, the long term impacts as something that we probably need to understand better. There, the role of universities will come. And there, the role of the younger people like Rajat spoke, I spoke from his heart, will come to understand as to how and where we can, what should be our role with regard to, uh, you know, uh, leading these uh, uh, catastrophes being avoided. First, I just want to give you one small comparison. The blast from the little boy. Little boy was the bomb that was sent on Hiroshima. The blast from the little boy released about 15 kilotons of energy, equivalent to 15,000 tons of TNT, and sent a mushroom cloud up to the height of about 25,000 feet. The other bomb that was called the Fat Man, that, was, that produced about 21 kilotons. And today, B83, the available bomb, is about 1.2 megatons, equivalent to about 1 lakh 20,000 or 12 lakh tons of TNT, making it 80 times more powerful than the bomb that was sent on Hiroshima, you can well understand. We can also wish that these bombs are never, never ever used because this will not hit a city, this will hit a country, this will hit humanity very hard. So it becomes very terrifying. And uh, uh, in 19, uh, it, it get, it's the largest nuclear weapon ever detonated is uh, the Tsar Mamba, set off by the Soviet Union in 61 which produced about a 50 megaton blast, about 3,333 times more powerful than the little boy bomb that was that leveled the entire city of Hiroshima. So uh, you can see that it is, this is the largest man-made explosion to date, which sent the mushroom cloud up to the height of about 130,000 feet in altitude, about four and a half times the height of Mount Everest, as it is sent shockwaves around the globe three times over. If we wanted to, we, would, we could build a bomb even more powerful than the Tsar Bomba. Maybe it's time we start looking to use nuclear fusion for something else. Nuclear answers are not going to solve the problems of peace. Uh, then the cost factor, of course. The cost factor is that today only UN, US, only for nuclear forces, it costs about 494 billion for only nine year period. So it is costing, say, about $12 million per hour on maintaining these weapons. So what is the purpose that is going to solve? That's the question that we need to ask probably, that uh, the, the ICAN estimates that the nine nuclear armed countries have spent about $72.9 billion on their 13,000 plus nuclear arms in 2019 equaling to about $138,699 every minute of, on, on, in 2019 on nuclear weapons. And uh, this is a huge increase of about $7.1 billion on uh, 2018. So today, the current estimates are, of course, nobody declares the exact numbers, but the today's estimates are that there are about 13,350 five nuclear weapons available in the world. India is a poor in this, that of course is about 130. Pakistan has more than that. Uh, UK has more than China, France, of course, USA and Russia. Russia has the maximum 6,370 nuclear weapons with them. North Korea with 20 is also threatening the entire world. One small point that, that is very pertinent to miss is to, to mention here, of course, is that uh, we have a number of near misses in nuclear weapons. That's a very interesting history. There are number of incidents when uh, it almost became a nuclear war. There are uh, uh, 
13 incidences that can be that are listed officially on uh, nuclear near misses and the very interesting fact is that most of these near nuclear misses were due to technical misunderstanding these were not on the reality real life situation that the war broke from one side and therefore the other side had to answer they were all because of computer bugs and misunderstanding and misinterpretation so look at the cost that we are paying for this is small near misses and one small mis misunderstanding and it will be a catastrophe of different sorts um, it is therefore avoidable i now uh, come to uh, uh, very quickly i come to the biological weapons and it was the official uh, first use that the us made was in 1763 when british officers planned to distribute blankets with the smallpox that was the first noted uh, uh, attempt that of biological weapon uh, today of course the use of biological weapons have been used primarily for by individuals rather than groups and you have the powders called the anthrax and all that that are mentioned uh the types of biological weapons include bacterial which is the plague and anthrax or flu fever and many people of course now are talking about the coronavirus as well uh, as a as a weapon uh, not as a disease uh chemicals weapons of uh, mass destruction are also in use for many many years in fact we are uh, as far as official record is concerned in 1000 bc chinese used arsenic for and uh, then of course it became a very Extensive use in world wars, both one and two, and uh, then then uh, 1995, sarin was used uh, in subway in Tokyo. So number of these uh, chemical weapons have been used in past uh, by different groups and individuals. Uh, fortunately, not by countries officially. Now uh, I, I can I can quickly come to what universities may do. That is the point that I need to answer or understand also. Rajat mentioned some of the points that the young generation thinking. I was also reading in uh, QA and uh, chat of uh, you know chat box what the top the younger generation is uh, worried about. Uh, let me begin with a small uh, note or caveat. I would say that the Indian education. Scenario which is, stands today is, is a kind of missed opportunity. I would say we have missed uh, the target or the goal uh, by a long my, margin, and therefore the Indian education currently in the scenario, scenario is that it is misdirected, and therefore it doesn't bring peace in the minds. When it doesn't bring peace in the mind, you can't expect peace in the action either. So we need to do a lot on uh, on improving the Indian education scenario per se. Uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Sabu mentioned about uh, the value-based education. We have to correct it in a wholesale business. Uh, the national education policy 2019 is uh, now. So I'm really to sorry to interrupt, uh, but we have received many, many questions also. So I have to keep some time in reserve for questions. I am just so please. I am yeah. finishing you. in about two, two and a half minutes. Uh, so that shows that society is basically showing some angst. We need to understand that. That, that angst is a psychological problem which will lead to you know uh, psychological issues of uh, fighting out anything and everything physically and uh, mentally so minds have to be calmed down and we universities have to create a very strong narrative very strong narrative against violence against war against any kind of war and then probably that will be the greatest role that academia can provide is to the the, the the calmness to the society the basic feeling of being uh, controlled and calm and uh, I, I will probably begin i uh, end with uh, the famous shanti mantra uh, as given by in yajurveda om deva shanti rakshana antiriksham shanti pratri shanti kapa shanti roshadeha shanti vanaspateha shanti vishve deva shanti brahma shanti Sarvam Shanti Shanti Reva Shanti Sama Shanti Redi Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. This peace has to be there in everything that we have to talk about. Peace has to be a holistic phenomenon, not an individual thing. Uh, I would stop here and uh, expect some questions. To thank you, sir. Have, which have been raised. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your thoughts and thank you very much for reciting those Shanti mantras. Uh, that that reminds us of our. Uh, 
with our founder who's with us today, and he has given us the similar, well, uh, I would say prayer that we uh, we recite in entire Mighty World Peace University lab for the last 40 years. Uh, it, it's called World Peace uh, Prayer. And uh, that is the gift of our beloved founder, Dr. Vishwanath Karatsa, to all of us. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your thoughts. Thank you very much for your ideas. And now it's my honor and privilege to introduce you to the next guest speaker of this session, Dr. Sandeep Sancheti Ji, Honorable Vice Chancellor of SRM Institute of Science and Technology and former president of Association of Indian Universities. Dr. Sancheti, known as an institution builder, holds a PhD from Queen's University, Belfast, UK, after obtaining a BTEC from Regional Engineering College, Warangal, and MSc Engineering from Delhi College of Engineering in 1982 and 85, respectively. He is now the Vice Chancellor of SRM IST Chennai. Prior to this, he was the President of Manipal University, Jaipur, Director of National Institute of Technology, Delhi, and the Director of NITK, uh, Suratkar. He has also served as the Director in Charge of NIT Thiruchirappalli, NIT Calicut, School of Planning and Architecture, SPA Delhi, and Mentor Director of NIT Goa, NIT Puducherry, and NIT Sikkim. Dr. Sanchi began his professional career at MBN Engineering College, Jodhpur, as Assistant Professor in the Department of ECE in 1984 and later moved on to Malavia Regional Engineering College, Jaipur, as Associate Professor in 1990. Sir, it is indeed our honor and privilege to have you here today with us. Thank you very much for joining us. And without wasting a minute, I would hand over the charge to you. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Gautam Ji. Thank you, Prashant Ji. Good evening to everyone. And good evening to my co-panelists. Uh, very happy to be part of this. Uh, uh, it was a great deal learning by listening to the other panelists here, but uh, I may not be so wise and so capable to discuss what has been discussed. But I'm sorry uh, to interrupt you, but yeah. I could see uh, the panelists' uh, uh, cameras are not working. If I may request everyone in the panel, if you could please uh, uh, make... Uh, yes, thank you very much so that we can see you. Thank yeah, you, thank so. you very much. Thank, thank you, you very much. Sorry to interrupt. Please go ahead. Thanks to MIT World Peace University and Kararsa for this invitation. It's my third interaction and always a learning experience and something new. And, and the kind of activities you are able to take up are really wonderful, very different, very unique, and therefore I appreciate it. Our today's topic obviously is uh, about uh, the, the biological and chemical weapons and how do we counter that or mitigate those threats. That's fine. And there are lots of things which probably will be qualifying as the weapons of mass destruction, in my opinion. And therefore, I'll probably change certain direction here and make sure that I'll, uh, I'll uh, probably introduce you with these certain new dimensions of the threat which are going to come and which are going to affect. So it's obvious that uh, the threat of, uh, uh, you can say, the our existence is basically from very, very old age. Many instances were given by the uh, uh, other learned speakers. You can call dynamite, you can call the nuclear threats which are there or whatever it is there. Even the air and water possibly can be a threat because it can be poisoned, things can go wrong. And we know that a lot of people attribute a lot of things in terms of destruction or affecting the mankind is due to the environment, poor air quality or whatever particle densities and other things which are there in the air which is suspended. So I'm not going to talk about that. Same way with the biological and chemical. They are the relatively new generation in terms of those threats and we are seeing corona as one which is uh, affecting us. You can put it in that category. Uh, still corona needs carrier. Still uh, maybe there has to be a physical contact for that to happen. There has to be a vehicle or a mechanism to spread it. And therefore, I'll still say that they are threats, but they may be still uh, limited in certain sense. Therefore, I'll come to something very, very different, which belongs to my domain, I would say. I'm not necessarily uh, like uh, what was said by Dixit Ji, that he is not from the technology of the science. I can say that I'm not from the biological or chemical sciences. I'm from the electrical engineering or electronic engineering side. And therefore, I will take three threats, which are going to be the real threats in future, for us. And uh, uh, the first one would be the mechanical related threat. The second one would be the computer. And the third one, the most restrictive would be for me, 
would be the electronic threat. And let me come to the, uh, the mechanical threat. We know that uh, robots are now coming into picture. We know that robots are nothing but machines. We know that the robots have become intelligent with artificial intelligence and various other things. They have huge endurance and all that. The only thing which probably robots uh, didn't have was that they could not reproduce themselves, which the mankind could. But with the 3D uh, invention of 3D or 3D printing or whatever, you can say the additive manufacturing, I think one can technically say that the robots can print themselves or the 3D machines can be robots which can print further robots. And we have seen this such a kind of a thing in a movie which was uh, acted upon by Rajini Kant and which became very famous and very sought after. And the name of the movie was Robot. And in the movie itself, they talked about multiplying the robots and they challenged the mankind. So that's one kind of a thing that the machines can mass produce, machines can be intelligent, they can overpower us and they can probably make us lose very easily. I will still say that this threat is also not so big because it's still a physical threat. So many robots will have to move around and various other things. And therefore, you can say that this threat may be a still mild threat, but still it can uh, possibly affect us. The second threat would be the computer threat or the IT threat or whatever is happening in the domain of uh, digital world today. Internet and IoT. I think we are heavily dependent upon this. Today, if uh, though there is no internet, we would not have met, we would not have been discussing this and would not have been shrinking the globe. We have shrunk the globe. Once we have shrunk the globe because of that, you can say that the globe is in, in, in control of someone now because it's so small that it can be easily handled and tackled and maybe, maybe destroyed also. And imagine that if internet is not there today, all the transportation, all the banking, all the finance, all the railways, on the supply chains, everything will go off. And simple bugs and viruses, which are generally invisible, two lines of codes can possibly destroy it. And imagine that if you're confined to your home, you cannot move out, you cannot open your houses, you cannot start AC because it's controlled by some IoT or whatever automation sensor, which is a new way of life. Imagine what will happen to our life. So indirectly, once again, it will destroy the business, it will destroy the economy, and that is what we are feeling. That even the biological things are being felt by us or the chemical things are being felt by us because it's destroying the economy. We are not worried much about Corona. I think in India, I've seen people are daring it, saying, oh, nothing happens. But what happens with the economical changes probably are making them uncomfortable. And therefore, computer also has that power. IT, that has power. IoT and internet has that power that it can destroy you very, very easily. And all the medical records and medical controls and everything will also get affected. So once again, this threat can be a realistic threat. Once again, whether you call it weapon or not, it can do mass destruction for me and therefore it's very important. The third one, the final one, which I wanted to share with you, I'll try to save time if I can by being short. And if there are questions, I'll answer that, is the electronic and the domain to which I belong to. I hope you know a word called radiation. Yes, radiations do happen from nu nuclear things and other things. I'm talking of a normal radiation, ultraviolet, infrared, or microwave, or millimeter wave, or terahertz wave, whatever you can say. Why I'm saying why it is powerful and why it can destroy. We all fear as Indians typically that God can destroy us if we don't behave. Now, let me tell you, these waves are nothing but gods. These waves, uh, not in the sense, some equivalence I can establish. Like God, they are invisible. Like God, they are omnipresent. And like God, they can do anything to us. They can heat us up, they can cool us down, they can do anything immediately. And therefore, it's something like uh, a demigod, you can say these waves. And if the radiation is not controlled, the radiation can kill anyone. And imagine, uh, a situation where I was saying that everything which you said, biological, chemical, or maybe computer or robotic, will have to be carried from one place to another place. In this case, nothing is to be carried. Just put one space station, which can be a high altitude platform at 2,000, 1,000 kilometer above the ground, or it can be a satellite at 36,000 kilometer, which many countries have already put. And that signal to be beamed at a given country or in a given footprint where you want to do the damage, uh, you can easily do. You uh, uh, Let me tell you, your TV or your mobile, everything can be stopped in one minute's time if the signal or the noise signal or the jamming signal is beamed from them. Right now, the, the, the ITU regulations prohibit someone to go beyond a certain 
signal strength. The moment we are at war, we are in difficulty, the signal levels can be increased by anyone. There are spy satellites, there are various other things. Once the level goes up, everything will come to stand still because there is no communication. When there is no communication, there is no computer, internet, and then obviously radiation can affect you uh, very, very badly. Imagine one of you standing in a sun for two hours, a direct sun in a hot uh, summer. I think you will simply fall down. You will simply be getting affected. That is the power of radiation. That is the power sometimes people talk about very small thing called mobile that is it affecting me by radiation but imagine a bigger radiation coming to you so there are high power sources which can be generated very easily megawatts and uh, things of that nature can be done at microwave frequencies and therefore these can destroy you through the satellite with single control unfortunate part of it is like corona uh, unlike corona, you cannot see it, you cannot feel it, you cannot touch it, you cannot stop it also. You cannot confine it also because the radiation just simply passes through most of the things, except for some metallic shields, et cetera, which are there. So, I, my dear friends, this is a threat which I think is a new generational threat. Most of the wars will be fought by the new generation. All of us know that the war will be fought because of water, but the war will not be necessarily fought by the foot soldiers or the people. War will be fought indirectly as we are trying to see even now so what are the universities what they can do and i think some, a few smaller points i would like to highlight here number one uh, we need to make the education where the discretion is being taught very easily people can differentiate what is right and wrong the knowledge should be how to apply it and where to apply it and not to just to mug and deliver that this is how you can design something i think a knowledge uh, uh, sense has to be changed and therefore its application has to be more emphasized and then its pros and cons has to be discussed because everything in life has pros and cons. So would be the case in terms of technology and also in the education. The second thing obviously is the societal awareness. What is right and what is wrong in terms of doing these things? Many people do it because of mischief. Many people create such uh, devices and disturb. Jammers are very common things which are happening in the current world where things are uh, there. But right now, they may not be having high power. The moment they have high power, there will be a slow poisoning to you or maybe faster poisoning also, in my opinion. The third thing would be, of course, we have started doing it, promotion of ethics, values, and environmental aspects and all that. Nothing wrong with that. We should always do that. These are general points. But let me come to the scientific points which are important for curbing what I have said in terms of the new uh, range of challenges. Number one. Our research should be in right direction. Research has gone wrong and therefore we blame COVID uh, has come into picture. The same way a wrong research can lead us to what we call those satellites and the uh, high performance devices and high power devices, etc. And therefore research has to right direction in the sense that uh, uh, all the controls should be there in certain ways in terms of limits, ranges and prescriptions which are there, standards which are there. So standards education, standards following standards checking autonomous uh, working but then still uh, auditing and all that of all important scientific things very important for, for the mankind and number two would be developing sufficient countermeasures would be equally important if something happens can we today survive without an internet can the airlines railways distribution supply chain work uh, without without all that or banks finance imagine my I have a lot of money but my bank is unable to discharge or deliver that money to me what is that money of any use to me so I think that is the difficulty and therefore once again we have to make sure that counter measures or the parallel measures or appropriate technologies are available to fall back just an example that once the they, 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 a tsunami kind of a thing happened all the communications completely broke down and the Andaman and Nicobar was just not connected for one or two days. We had to fall back on the age old thing called ham radio to make the first connect with them that what is happening and it cannot give any video, it cannot give any audio, it can be only dashes and dots. So in same telegraphic age kind of a thing that how you communicate and what you communicate. So we'll have to have such resources available to us if we need to avoid destruction or maybe minimize the destruction with that i will close thank you so much for this opportunity thank, thank you. you thank you very much dr sanchiti thank you very much for sharing your thoughts it is indeed it was honor and privilege to listen to you thank you very much for that
And now it is my pleasure that I introduce you to the next uh, eminent speaker of this session, the former Vice Chancellor of Maharashtra University of Health Sciences, Nashik, Professor Dr. Arun Jamkarji. Professor Dr. Arun Jamkar, born and brought up in the Marathwada region of Maharashtra, witnessing the struggle of the underprivileged uh, made him went to work towards uh, the, the suffering and the dreams of become the doctor uh, took shape. Over the years, he has helped uh, create an ecosystem for interdisciplinary research between science, technology, Ayurvedic, and homeopathic medicine. Uh, one such example of interdisciplinary collaboration would be clinical engineering by creating engineers for hospitals. He wishes to continue to serve the society by applying technology to improve the health and quality of life of the common man. He is proud that he created a moment, uh, a, a movement for of teaching bioethics in medical curriculum through National Nodal Center of UNESCO Chair of Bioethics in Haifa in all state uh, medical universities of India. This was possible for him because of his position as Chairman of Association of Health Professional Universities of India. Sir, thank you very much for you joining us today and going to share your thoughts and we all are eager to listen to you. Thank you, thank you very much for joining. Over to you, sir. So if you can please unmute yourself. Uh, we, yeah, please go ahead, please go ahead. Can hear you now. So please go ahead, we can hear you, please go ahead. I'm not able to share my PowerPoint. Yeah, now uh, you'll be able to. Uh, uh, yeah. You see a rectangle, yeah. Okay. Yes, we can uh, see your content. Okay. Uh, let me thank Dr. Rahul Karad and Dr. Vishwanathji Karad for inviting me. For, so could you please uh, go in uh, full screen mode for your slide? Uh, it is not full screen mode. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. So this is very apt for the World Peace University to work on this. It's a major project of eradication of biological and chemical weapons. So let us get blessings of uh, Ganpati ji. And then uh, all my earlier speakers, they were trying to give a elaborate discussion about nuclear wars and subsequently what is happening there. The whole world is uh, engrossed in protecting ourselves from the nuclear war. And uh, as a TED Talk series, uh, Bill Gates has said that we are not prepared for simple biological warfare or maybe maybe something like a, say, viral epidemic. Now, as a university, we stand for humanism, for tolerance, for reasons, and adventure of ideas. And I think uh, as a WP university, it has been most appropriate, and let me congratulate both for taking this, uh, say, very appropriate topic for the world peace, because we share, we call world peace, and this world peace. And therefore, uh, we need to travel from resource-based economies to the knowledge-based economies and society and uh, everybody looks at university for the responsibilities and i think by organizing this conference we are satisfying these responsibilities so i'm certain i think uh, uh, i might be giving more justice to biological warfare and this whole thing was with uh, michael christian's uh, book and uh, movie called an andromeda strain where i'm not going to say show much but then whole thing is about uh, a satellite and coming in New Mexico, where they were showing some which uh, which was able to do what is called a section and then create whole species in creating uh, a so what is called a it gets sucked inside. And then this was such that the whole thing was taken out. And this was a this was a movie which created something about the biological warfare. Now, uh, I just want to find out that how universities can help in uh, getting these biological warfares. And then I think uh, the first thing that I want to suggest is we need all of the international community after the corona uh, say pandemic. You think that this whole thing is because of a. What you call as in biological warfare, 
And therefore, we need to find out what are the various treaties, various conventions. I'm not going to much detail, but the United Nations has already has this. And as a, as a university, I think we need to give leadership to the world to find out a better treaty because nobody wants a biological warfare and nobody wants to do anything. But then because somebody is doing that, doing it, I think that would be the greatest service as university to lead, to find out how the biological warfare can be stopped and how the, all those agents manufactured can be stopped. The greatest danger of this is that they could land up with a terrorist and then biological weapon could be used and leading to biological bioterrorism. I think this, this treaty has to be given by World Peace University to the world to find out how effective it is. Now, let us find out what is happening is all biological warfare is going in detail. And therefore, all these agents, uh, everybody talk of that, but then there might be a lot of other agents which has not been, say, seen and studied and might be available. So we need to create a research by the universities for the potential organisms of biological warfare. And secondly, suppose we have a treaty to find out how to monitor the programs of the rogue countries. And these are the various agents, category A, category B, category C. And in the category C, we can see the corona. And therefore, what is required to use an artificial intelligence to view a, what is called as a cognitive domain of the text mining of the data of biological warfare and create an AI system, a platform to find out what are the various biological agents available. And therefore, there are so many that the human intelligence is not enough. So uh, I just can quote you that after the corona pandemic, the benevolent AI, they put an AI system to use and they found out more than a billion molecules to use and then they, they were able to find out exactly what is working. So on similar basis, we could use an artificial intelligence system to find out exactly the spectrum of biological warfare. And then we need to study what are the methodology used for delivering these agents and then we'll go further. Now, uh, let me now come to viruses which has been used, which can be used as a biological agent because these are most animals. The viruses, virus they, they just get cells. attached. Like now the, this is corona to the androgen receptor, converting receptor, the and then well, it goes inside what is called by a process called as endocytosis. And then once it goes inside, they take care and they, they engulf inside and then they take whole, whole mechanism of protein production within the cell by converting into mRNA and then putting into it. And therefore these, once it goes inside, then instead the protein being secreted by a, a cell, he starts producing viruses and they become a factor of virus. And then they, they, all these viruses, they come out and then by exocytosis. So this is, I think, the most intelligent, uh, say, they are not even organisms because they are alive only within the cell. And therefore, this potential is being used by all of us. And then they go on mutating. And therefore, once they mutate, then uh, it becomes still difficult. So all these guys who are using for the biological warfare are used, trying to use this mutation and where also we require an AI system. And then the viruses now, they are getting sick, say they, they create what is called the synthetic biology. And where now the viruses are nothing but RNA and DNA. These are the primitive animals. And therefore, once we have that, it's very easy to create. And the if you create something new, that is far more dangerous than natural because the synthetic polio virus. And at this juncture, people are thinking that the coronavirus is a synthetic virus because it is so powerful that all the ecosystem of a natural virus is not there. And a natural virus cannot be, cannot be so dangerous. And now, now, this is a, what is called as a, this is a woman called Hannah's bat woman. So she says that the coronavirus is a tip of iceberg. And there are so many viruses around, and then there might be several in the bats. And therefore, we are just showing at the, just a tip of iceberg. So what is required is to do an entire research, to find out whole profile of the, all those viruses which can be done. And therefore, what is required is 
how they can stop by using biological warfare. Now we have evil empires like China and Korea. Now everybody is suspecting that the whole virus of pandemic of Corona has been from China because otherwise, now they are being evil empire. They don't follow ethical principles. Otherwise, how in a, when the whole world is fighting against Corona, people are dying and China is creating border problems, disputes. They are going into our India. They are going into South China. Going to Hong Kong. So I think that whole thing gives a suspicion that it might be whole thing as a biological warfare. And then the China. The other thing is North Korea, which is which has the biggest facility available for creating the biological threats. Bacteria and virus with North. No, the problem is all these. Biological laboratories can accidentally release viruses. And therefore, it's still more dangerous because they don't want to have biological warfare, but then they, something finds accidentally. And once something finds accidentally, let, we have to use again some AI system like they are used by Kamran Khan after uh, he has a company called Blue Dot. And where the biological, let's say, after the virus pandemic, he was able to just exactly tell you. Where the where the viruses will be going, so I think uh, this is all about uh, creating a situation and research in biological warfare. Now we can uh, we have to train leaders, and therefore the leaders are required because they, these all leaders will handle the pandemic, and therefore training to create leadership in biological warfare preparedness. And I think uh, we have the school of governance, then the, the other university they have school of democracy. We should have programs in how to handle the biological warfare uh, pandemics. And this is what is required is called a meta-leadership. And therefore, this meta-leadership goes beyond. And uh, this is the one where everything of uh, leadership is required to report, to find out. It is 360 degree leadership of the event, the context, and the problem, and the culture. So I think all these requires a study in detail about how, how the biological warfare is going, how to control, how to monitor, how to stop that. And therefore, this requires a detailed research. And I would appreciate uh, Dr. Vishwanath at MIT Peace University to start a chair in biological warfare under MIT W. But that might be a most impactful thing to happen in giving leadership to the world. Obviously, we require to train people to find out what are the things happening. Now, there are several programs are available. MIT WPU should start uh, programs. Universities in India, I always say that they don't use their academic autonomy. Now, uh, there are several universities we are having a master's degree in biological weapons. You know, Oxford is starting similar programs. I think MIT WPU or whole universities in India, looking at biological warfare should create uh, people to find out and how to train them and therefore create a program. And obviously, I want to end with this, what is called as appreciative inquiry. So we want to find out what is the problem going. So we need to dream a society in a world without biological warfare, say biological agents, and then design what we can do and then deliver. I think with this 4D cycle, we can have uh, something to do, uh, all the universities can do to help get this world free of biological agents. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your views. Thank you very much uh, for uh, sharing with us the, the piece of wisdom. And now, without taking much time, I would like to go to the questions and answers. Uh, the first question is coming for uh, Dr. Sabu Thomas. Uh, so the question is coming to you, and the question says, question is from uh, Rajit Singh. Uh, the question is, sir, after this uh, pandemic situation, uh, well, the question seems little out of context, but let me take it. <laughs> uh, the, as a vice chancellor, probably this question must be coming to you. Uh, the question says, uh, after this uh, pandemic is over, how exactly, uh, what are the steps that we should take uh, to come back to schools or universities? That's a very interesting question for me. Uh, after the pandemic, what we are going to do is, we are going to, uh, introduce a blended mode of teaching, evaluation. Yes, during pandemic, we were, we were completely online. 
Now I told the students and teachers that we have to utilize both the, uh, in the online and offline sort of blended way. I would say 70 to 30. Our students should be exposed to all sorts of innovations. So if we have another pandemic, we should be prepared for that. And I, uh, we are also going to give probably some of the examinations online. And we are going to give training to the faculty members. So if again a pandemic is coming, we should be prepared for that. We should be prepared to face it. So we are, I'm going to adopt a sort of blended mode of teaching, learning and evaluation process. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, the next question is coming to for, uh, for Dixit, sir. And the question is coming from uh, Sumanta Bhattacharya. Uh, sir, the question is, what kind of modern digital education uh, will, will come into this world after this pandemic situation? Over to you, sir. Very interesting question, but the answer is not as uh, easy as it appears. One is that the pandemic uh, is over, or we are already talking about post-COVID. I don't think COVID is going to go away. Sorry, like sir. That. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, uh, Thomas, sir, could you please uh, mute from your sides uh, because we are getting an echo. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Am I audible now? Okay. So what I was saying that uh, I'm already listening to a lot of uh, discussions on different platforms that post COVID, what we are going to do. I don't think there'll be a post COVID phenomenon. We have to be with COVID phenomena. You know, COVID is not going to disappear like this. And as I, as we wish that uh, by say a certain amount of time, there will be no COVID in the world. COVID will remain. COVID-19 will also remain. We will probably understand how to find an answer to or how to find a, a, a medicine for this. So COVID is going to be there. Uh, for me, uh, the, the, the digital question is uh, like this, because the Indian scenario is this, that as you mentioned, 31 crore, uh, I, I think Rajat mentioned the number of his students in the, in the country is a huge number. And everybody doesn't have access to the same digital platform as it is available to certain privileged few in the bigger cities probably. However, I take uh, the teaching as a two-part uh, business. One will be the instructional part, and other is the discussion part. What I would suggest is that the instructional part can be handed over to the digital platform where a lot of information that need to be given to the teachers so that they can analyze the problem in the right perspective because the information doesn't give perspective. Perspective to be given by the college and the university as they are. But low I think, uh, uh, Dikshit, sir, I think I'm sorry. I think we are losing you. I think you have some um, network challenge at your end. But nevertheless, I hope it would. Uh, no, we, your voice is breaking. But nevertheless, uh, I think uh, we can wait uh, till the connection improves from your side uh, a minute or two. But meanwhile, let me uh, pose the next question, which is coming for Dr. Sancheti. And the question is coming from Jaita Brahma. And the question is, sir, do you think that other than teaching peace directly in education, is there any other way of uh, bringing ethics and peace into teaching? Uh, I think uh, uh, it's a tough question for me. Let me accept that first. Uh, I would uh, love to give you a technological aspect of an answer, but uh, I think teaching something is uh, uh, rather easy. Practicing that is the most difficult. And it becomes uh, most difficult because India is very, very competitive. And uh, there's always a uh, uh, you know, neck to neck competition for everything. And therefore, in Indian conditions, sometimes uh, it is said that uh, might is right. And with that, all those ethics and everything goes to a toss or to a spin. And therefore, it's pretty difficult. But let me tell you that the technology can always uh, teach you such things very easily. You try to play with an experiment, play with a chemical, uh, let's say lab, play with an electronic device, and try to drive it with extra current or put some voltage and do some concentration level changes it will immediately backfire on you. And that will make you realize that we have to be in the control. And that is the way ethics will tell you. Ethics doesn't mean to say that you don't do this, don't do that. They say do whatever, but do within the limits and do it without harming to others. So I think, uh, uh, yes, teaching fraternity can always 
deliver and inculcate what we call ethics more effectively. But my belief is that that's more, uh, uh, one would not like it, but I would say that's more at the schooling level where the foundation is being laid. We are probably doing, dealing with more of the elevation side. Yes, we can also do whatever correction is required, but it should be at the foundational level that how they uh, are brought up uh, initially. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for that answer. So next question is coming for Dr. Jamkar, uh, and it is from Samson Chiru. And the question is, sir, if the peace is state of mind, and if war or anger is also a state of mind, why can't we have the entire mind filled with one state instead of uh, two? <laughs> <laughs> Very good question. Very good yeah, question. It is. I think uh, peace per se is an emotional entity. So spiritually or metaphysically, if you are at peace with yourself, you are at peace with the world. And therefore, Gandhiji has already said, if you want to change the world, change yourself. Now, the question is, we are having, say, virus, say corona pandemic. How can you be at peace at home, sitting at lockout? But I think we need to understand that that is the only thing that we can have to help the world. Therefore, the moment you are convinced, then you will have peace within you. And that will like, reflect outside. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. The next question, uh, where I believe that was a really tough one, but thank you very much for that answer. Uh, but the next question is coming for the entire panel. The, the uh, Dr. Supreet Surya is asking the question, but he has mentioned uh, any name, so I suppose it is open for entire panel. The question is, uh, sir, are we really marching ahead with proper planning? Is technology ruining the basic principles of life? It's a big question. Yes, sir. Sancheti, sir, I think technology, yes. <laughs> no, no, no. Everyone is uh, uh, qualified to answer that. The first answer to that last question, which was a tough question, uh, whether there are two states or 10 states, all states will coexist. That's the nature. Nothing is permanent in the nature. We cannot say that uh, we are Amar or we cannot be destroyed, okay? We cannot be glorifying ourselves. And in that sense, whatever has come into existence will change. And therefore, uh, change is must. And therefore, there will be more than one state. If it is only one state, it's permanent. More than one state, you'll be transiting between them. I just give you an electronic example for that. We are all craving for a good signal. Right now, you said that someone was not getting signal and therefore it was lost. But let me tell you, uh, the noise corrupts that or noise affects that. And therefore we minimize the noise or reduce the noise or avoid the noise. But the fact of the matter is, if we make the noise zero, the signal will also not be there. The signal will not be generated. And therefore for signal to exist, the noise has to be there. So you can understand that they are in interdependent states. And that would be the case with everything, good, bad, right, wrong, black, white, whatever, uh, something like that. That's an answer to that. And for the, for the technological things, uh, I think uh, the, the punch of the question, pro probably if you can repeat, that's fine. But otherwise, my answer to uh, the, the technological thing is uh, technology drives us to a hilt in terms of its potential. And, and, and it's like a transient. It goes up the steady state. It goes down below the steady state. And therefore, it keeps us driving. But there is one thing that whatever comes into existence technologically, finds a niche for itself, finds a place for itself, finds a use for itself, and the new technology then overtakes. And that's how the technological world drives. So that's why I said, make the standards, make sure that someone is going True. beyond standards, all that if you can do, I think uh, technology will not do harm to us. By the way, technology yeah. is supposed to be our slave. Technology is supposed to assist us. Technology is supposed to make us more comfortable. But when we go into the access side of the technology, obviously anything in access is bad, as we know it very yeah. well. That's the state of technology. Also. Thank you very much for that answer, Dr. Sancheti. But uh, unfortunately, why I don't know, but every uh, movie that we see or any sci-fi movie that is uh, shown. Yes, sir, I'd come to you, sir, Jamkar, sir. Then uh, I can generally, I can yes, sir, I'll come to you. Yeah, okay, yes. please go ahead. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. I think uh, as regards technology is concerned, because I am talking about healthcare, I am a surgeon. 
my firm belief is the all healthcare problems of the world and society can only be solved by technology. Because you can't just increase the number of doctors and nurses, but you can increase their effectivity by using technology, like say wearable technology or maybe IOTs and everything. And then uh, what is the importance of technology is all to improve the quality of life. Now let us find out how technology is help in this viral epidemic. Now I think if there was no technology, then there might be far more deaths than what we have. Now I talk about the blue dot. They told all the, all the capitals in the world one week before that your patient is coming. And they were just identifying what is called as a flight data of all flights across the world within a trillion miles. Same thing, all these new drugs coming, all these new drugs coming, effectivity they are doing by technology because they're using systems to find out what are the drugs available, what are the drugs which can be used. I think this whole thing is by technology. And suddenly, new well, I would like to uh, I would like to add one uh, one thing to your question uh, answer, Jamkar sir. Because there's one question coming uh, to you only. It was intended by Dr. Veenak Shirsagar, who is assistant professor at MIT WPU. And she asked, in golden days, uh, in, in the old times, we had mantra shakti and today we have tantra shakti. But do you think in future, don't you think that we would become, we would become slaves of the technology? Uh, as Sanchiti sir was saying, exactly ulta, but then do you think we would be going the other way? I don't think we become slaves of technology. At the end, we are developing technologies and therefore at the end, we are very selfish. We won't let technology win over you. And therefore we want to make it perfect. Let us say robots. At the end, robots would be there. Now imagine all robots being used for uh, say surveillance. Now the corona positive patient, nobody wants to go inside because of the risk and all the telemedicine, robotic monitoring, this whole thing is technology. I think mantra is going, tantra will come okay. and tantra will become mantra of tomorrow. Oh, great. Thank you very much for that answer. Last, uh, last question uh, for Dixit, sir. Uh, and the question is coming from uh, Bhasa. I'm sorry if I'm not uh, pronouncing it right. Uh, uh, do you think, I'm sorry, I just got scrolled. Yeah. Do you think India is ready for digitally transformed education? Do you think that every every knowledge seeker in India has equal access to technology? It's a big question, yeah. Uh, question is uh, having a two distinct parts. One is that, is India ready? Yes, India is ready. Second part is, do we have, everybody has the equal access? No, so far not. We have to create that uh, strength to reach to, the, to every corner of the country. Uh, fortunately, this kind of an epidemic has given us an opportunity to work, work very fast on this. And uh, India does have a capability. Uh, only Indians take India not so seriously because the world, rest of the world takes because the size that we have is something that nobody can match except China. So uh, we have to, you know, when we have a development of this sort uh, and the magnitude of this sort, and the urgency of this sort, these questions do emerge, but for digitally literacy, India is not only ready, they are capable. Uh, the best of the software skills are available yes. in India alone. I think that you're running the world basically for, uh, from software yes. side. Availability to every nook and corner, yes, that is required. And that is precisely where the government need to work on. Thank you, thank you very much. Any, any comments uh, uh, from uh, Dr. A Thomas? Quick, a quick addition to this, Technology will never be equal, equally spread uh, uh, in any case. You can see any technology, the point of origin will decide how it spreads, the costing will decide, and therefore you can see the solar, you can see the mobile, you can see various other things. Now it's the electrical vehicles which are there. They will spread, but slowly over a period of time, it will go away. And more we accept it and more we are ready, the cost will be lesser if we do the adoption and our own inventions and whatever. So let's not accept uh, that fact that technology is not equal to all of us. I think many of us are talking about that aspect. It will never be like that. So let's start doing digitalization as has been uh, promoted and pushed sure. by the COVID. Thanks, sir. Uh, you, uh, okay, Jamkar sir wants also to speak, Thomas sir also, and Pandey sir also. 
I, I re- <laughs> okay, please go ahead. I'm really running short of time. Please go ahead. Jump I, think, sir. Uh, I think technology will only solve all these problems of education. Uh, we are underestimating uh, Indian technology. Our penetration of internet is far bigger. In the recent study, there were more WhatsApp users in rural area than urban area. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for that. Over to you, Thomas, sir. We use all that because <laughs> my technology, technology, our whole spectrum of education widens and the whole teachers are available globally. I think we need to take shelter of technology. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Over to you. Yeah, my answer is very short. Science and technology for human welfare, for human needs, where the ethical issues come. So ethics have to be taught in all levels. That is answer number one. Answer number two, you talked about the digital divide. I'm sure that lots of people, they are not able to afford internet. They're not able to afford a computer, not able to afford a smartphone. Government should really support such students. Otherwise, we cannot preserve the, the, the point of inclusiveness, social justice. So my university, what we do is we provide computers, we provide smartphones, those who are not able to afford. Otherwise, we cannot, I mean, uh, fulfill the requirement of social inclusiveness. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Over to you, Pandey, sir. Sir, you're mute. Yeah, good, good evening to all of you. Uh, very brief, uh, very short. I have a one uh, uh, submission and one question also. Uh, Dr. Sanketi sir spoke about uh, the standardization and all those, the technology. We have to have a standardization, credibility and quality. Then only we can reach. But on the other hand, as rightly said by Thomas sir also, the rural connectivity is the biggest problem. Though we are talking of the digital India and so many things. But still, only 110 cities, they had a very good connectivity. But still, the rural connectivity is the biggest problem. The unemployment, the job shortage for next 35 years, there will be a job shortage. But my question is, how to tackle all this? Uh, data will not help us in this stopping the uh, transmissions, the corona. So we are talking of uh, so many things. Dr. Jamkar sir spoke the... Uh, uh, analytics is a big data, but still, at this stage, the, the data is misleading to the society. Uh, reverse migration has happened. The students are not getting to the uh, their choice-based colleges. The university education, uh, the examination, the, the even the course, and so many things are uh, stopped. The technology, uh, I mean, has its own limitations. So, how to prepare ourselves? How this reversing damage to the ecosystem? How it will happen? The question is open. <laughs> Anyone would like to take it quickly because I'm I'm really really running short of time. Yes, Jamkar sir. As regards uh, all this post COVID area now, uh, there is a huge problem about uh, taking examinations and keeping all the safe distancing. Uh, I was invited by Vice Chancellor to find out how technology can help. I think uh, we are underestimating again that we can have all those online platforms creating, uh, say, uh, say what is called as a question banks of uh, various difficulty index and conducting exams like a GRE or USMLE simultaneously everywhere. I think once you do that, the whole uh, uh, hindrance is conducting one exam in one hall to go away. And we need to find out, say, multiple question papers and conduct round the clock, and therefore the whole exam system can be there. I think this whole thing could be given for an online examination, when we can have online clinical examination like USMLE. So I think uh, we need to explore technology for evaluation. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I've really reached the end of time. I'm sorry. OK, such is a quick, quick inputs, quick inputs. Uh, Professor Pandey talked about joblessness because of the technology. Let me tell you, if I get the same comfort and same life, I'll be very happy to work for three days or four days and let others work for the remaining three days or four days. I think the jobs are going to take change of shape. We have known that once computers came, internet came, nothing went out. In fact, they helped us and created more jobs. For example, examination has become big business for the industry now. 
and therefore there will be new forms of jobs which will be there but ideally our life should become more comfortable today we are working hard saturdays and sundays evenings we are working should we work like that work like donkey no technology should be a donkey and therefore let it come up and support us that's what i would say i'll not be worried about the technology coming in a big way thank you thank you very much thank you very much for that healthy discussion it was really really interesting session where everybody was buzzing with ideas thank you very much but i'm really sorry that i've reached end of time uh, i'll have to move on to the next point on agenda and which is important uh, aspect of every session and which is voting on resolution uh, if i may request uh, everyone to please if they can please put on their microphones off uh, thank you uh, okay so here goes the resolution i'm getting the echo if i may request sancheti ji jamkar sir uh, if you could please uh, yeah jam uh, okay thank you thank you uh, voting on resolution uh, here goes the resolution we the participants at the international conference on eradication of biological and chemical weapons appeal to all the universities across the globe to in inculcate value of peace and cooperation amongst their students for the betterment of humanity and implement it in their education system in right earnest uh, please uh, start the voting process technical team yes everyone in the panel as well as everyone in the audience is requested to vote i'm sure you must have seen the voting window open in front of your eyes we have less than a minute uh, everyone in the panel everyone in the audience is requested to vote please go ahead make us understand what you think it is really high time that uh, we have to discuss the issue together and come up to the solution and the exact issue that has been discussed in this four day international conference on eradication of biological and chemical weapons thank you very much for being part of this and i'm sure you all must have voted last 20 seconds my friends please go ahead cast your vote so that we'll come to know that what you feel about this particular resolution last 10 seconds uh, please vote quickly 5 4 3 2 1 0 and the time is up i i request my technical team if they could please share with us what exactly is the outcome of this polling the voting on resolution few seconds and we'll see what exactly was the outcome i hope uh, this resolution because every resolution has been passed with uh, nobody against the resolution so that means oh wonderful that this also goes the same way everyone those who have voted have voted for the resolution thank you very much everyone for being part of uh, this uh, process and now uh, it is indeed of our honor and privilege that the person who saw uh, the dream of making the humanity understand that what exactly is the importance of peace and has been working on this path path for last four decade without taking a single break we are fortunate enough to have our beloved founder honorable professor dr vishwanath karat sir with us today in this session i would like to request him if he would like to address the gathering over to you sir thank you bapat uh, it has been my good fortune to listen to mr sabu thomas dr manoj dikshit dr sandeep sancheti and dr arun zamkar very learned vice chancellors thinkers philosophers some of them as scientists expressing their views about how to curb the misuse of weapons of mass destruction whether mainly the issue of eradication of biological and chemical weapons because of the horrifying danger which we have experienced for last two and a half months or three months the world over not in india alone the worry has been about the covid-19 and the corona virus whether man made or natural or in the whatever it is how it has come up we don't know it's the invisible corona virus which we have been trying to face with i think somebody might have comment post corona virus or post covid 
the common people are waiting whether that mask will go or not how much time it will take the question to my mind friends is you are a very learned people it's very nice way of presenting but the only thing is uh, we are not here to discuss about how the exams to be conducted what technology to be used and whether technology will resolve all the issues possibly it has been the danger of misuse of the science misuse of the technology and as i said in the morning too that the world is sitting on a ticking bomb like that. if you take the complete history of the stockpiles of the weapons which have been produced by the nations you know it very well rather than me that if something goes wrong it is wrongly triggered by some person who is a mad race player with a power game with a rat race having uncalled for ego the arrogance and the tendency to misuse the whole game for the greed the greed of power that is the real worry now let me tell you in the whole system of the world management the united nations or the who they have to come together to my mind and think very seriously because nobody is ready to listen to anyone else united nations came up but possibly it doesn't have the authority only those members who are the security council members they are busy among themselves in creating a rat race again a mad power game and the mad of supremacy that is the worry in how to change the mindset of these people whether it is possible for us whether a school of government like what we have started a school of democracy which we have been started at some places whether such schools are going to make a change and how much time it will take possibly the horrifying danger which we have been experiencing is something much beyond the question is now we are worried as teachers we are educationists and the universities world over they have got a certain duty certainly and as i said to you possibly to my friends i repeat this because i am talking to the honorable vice chancellors and my learned friends i repeat again friends remember as was said the body and the brain and the soul and the mind and it is this mind which needs to be med positive thinking mindset the destructive mind is not the requirement really speaking and the worry is really speaking if you know it friends if somebody trigger these weapons which are created developed already what will happen they say this earth mother earth the beautiful mother earth or the globe what we are where we the human beings are staying i think it can be burnt out turn into ashes maybe thousand times this is the situation what we are sitting on the question is because of this corona virus at least we have been trying to think by let us not do this and let us do this how to live and how not to live what is our religion what is our duty is the main issue and what is our limited capacity but certainly having some moral and ethical responsibility possibly we started the mit school of vedic sciences an ethical corporate management the ethical government management so many words can be used question is friends let us be realistic it is the misuse of science misuse of technology which has been made available by our intellectual people the worry is if it is wrongly used maybe this virus which has come up what country what place i don't want to discuss about it but remember friends this this mistake this error can cause a havoc and for the first time in the known human history i say it again 100 years back we have faced some such situations in the second world war we faced a horrifying situation the question is for the last 2 3 months time who made the mistake why the information was not given what is the nature of that virus it is having a life it is having dna rna whatever you call it but whether it is going to end after some time or we have to live with the same virus what it is question is for universities and colleges of of which you are heading 
or the world over we have been trying to do it's our sincere attempt and we have to fully understand the very mechanism which is going on and let me tell you friends as we say it always and i have been always talking about the same thing again for the vc's purpose i am showing this book again i showed it in the morning too here we have given a booklet just now in the last two and a half months time when this corona virus case started and i started looking for and writing some uh, issues i had a discussion with vijay bhatkar sir and many other scientists like dr mashrakar and i found that there is some secret behind and these were the nine universal secrets which are spoken by this philosopher sir naneshwara in whose name i don't want to reference then francis of assisi the dhaneshara puranda tav kanakdas whatever names you take the saintly people they are the real scientifically oriented people we call it the saints but this has been given 720 years back and this shows the very path way for the well being of the mankind it has given so many issues but this call is a nine universal secrets oblique principles of human life enunciated by the philosopher saint sri dhaneshara 720 years back which was revealed from here remember friend that time the google was not there the facebook was not there the artificial intelligence not there but artificial intelligence whether it is going to resolve the issue what we are facing and how and what way it will be only possible after the changing the little bit of mindset of the people and mindset of the leaders who are going to lead this whole world whole globe that is the issue let's try to do our sincere attempt and contribute our little share whatever is possible to make it a better place to live thank you thank you sir thank you very much for your views thank you very much everyone in the panel thank you very much audience for being there uh, in this very very important session uh, let me quickly remind you that tomorrow would be the last and day 4 of this four day national international conference on eradication of biological and chemical weapons and tomorrow uh, we will start with uh, the session 9 climate change poverty and pandemic is it time to recalibrate sdgs at 2 pm sharp i request everyone in the audience as well as in the panelists if you all would like to join us please do so tomorrow at 2 pm thank you thank you very much everyone see you good night thank you good night thank you so much thank you thank you thank you karan sir